Mahdi El Abdalouis says, What does Zidane need to do differently in the second leg to avoid a cop comeback? Should he play more conservatively, perhaps by bringing Fede in for Asensio, or should he trust the same lineup and make some more subtle tweaks? Thanks for everything that you do. I think you need to go, we kind of touched on this before, but I think you need to go with the same exact tactical approach in the sense that you need at least to to make Liverpool worry a, a little bit about their tra- their transition defense and and try not to push you uh, back on back on your on your defensive line as much as they did during the last 20 minutes of the game or so. I think it would be a mistake to trust Valverde from the get-go. I think it would kind of send the wrong message to the team and and say that okay we're going to be worried about defending the the score we have and that could be very dangerous if Liverpool actually managed to score a goal during the first half of the of the game or even during the first 30 minutes of the game so i think you need to 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 play this, the game with the with the same tactical approach which is try to explore to to exploit sorry Liverpool's vulnerability on on transition defense and in order to do so you need them definitely Asensio and Benicius on the flanks and and and, and Casemiro Modric and, and and Cross playing in the midfield. Well, I think I think if anything, <clears throat> I mentioned this on the post game podcast too. <clears throat> um, there's so many examples of. Teams in the, teams in the second leg going into the second leg with a with a comfortable lead, and just being way too conservative. And yeah, and we saw that PSG I mean, recently against against Barca, where they were just basically kind of lucky that Barca didn't capitalize. But they were basically not even on the field. They were just they thought they were just relying on a big lead in the first leg. We've seen it closer to home. We've seen it against Juventus when we went back to the Bernabeu. We were down three nothing, and then Ronaldo scored a penalty. Um, and I just think like I would rather, much rather, just have our put up, put our feet on their necks and just really yeah. just squeeze them. Because I, yeah, I even if it means yeah. risking a little bit, yeah. And I don't think it has to be that risky. Like I mean, what we did in the first leg wasn't quote unquote risky. It was just smart, good football. No. So it yeah. it just needs to be more of that. It just but but my point is, it doesn't need to be the opposite of you just going conservative. I think if there's no. like a tactical shift, it might be in response to the idea that Liverpool will almost undoubtedly be more aggressive with their press in the second leg. So what, what, whatever tactical tweaks you want to make to combat that, which is a different discussion. But in terms of conservatism, uh, I don't think you want to you want to just go into a deep block. I think that would be extremely uncomfortable. Agreed. Um, Agreed. And and yeah. by the way, Real Madrid's lead is not big enough. I mean, no, it's 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 virtually it, nothing. I know it's it's hard to look at it that way because it's a. I know, yeah. But it, it is exactly. it's not it's not that hard, hard to come back from three one. No, 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 not at all. I mean, if if Liverpool even managed to to keep the game uh, level zero zero by the sixtieth minute or so, and they find a goal there, Real Madrid will struggle a lot on the on the last twenty five thirty minutes of the game because Liverpool will push hard, and uh, and all it takes for them is just a single corner kick. So that lead is not is definitely not big enough for Real Madrid to settle and and just worry about defending. So I think that I, I might actually think that it might take Real Madrid to score a goal in order to to go through. I, I, I'm confident about Liverpool's attitude in this game, and I think that ultimately Real Madrid will better be ready to at least put a, a, a decent effort in trying to score a goal because otherwise I think the, the, that they could struggle. Um, I completely agree. Uh, question from Patrick Odiafati. He says, Hi, Kian and Lucas. Hope you're both well. Can you talk about the disrespect some of the English media and fans give our midfield three, saying Cruz, Modric, and Casemiro are past their best and can't win the midfield battle? The performance of those three in particular didn't surprise any Madrid fans, but it seemed as if the rest of the footballing world needed a reminder of their greatness. Even if they all may not be at their peaks on their day, they can boss any match. And how good was Tony Cruz? Has he ever not completed a long ball pass? He has to retire Real Madrid. Well, I think that for some reason Real Madrid have not established the narrative of Casemiro cross Modric being the best midfield trio at least of the century 
as well as Barcelona did with their own uh, with their own Xavi, Iniesta, and Busquets. I mean, I, I'm not saying that Casemiro, Cross, and Modric is way better is a way better midfield than the one I just mentioned. I particularly think that they that I would rather have this midfield trio than than Xavi, Iniesta, and Busquets, even as great as they were. But for some reason, you know, people don't buy into this narrative. I think Cross is criminally underrated player. I think that. I think for I, I, I'm being quite honest. I think that some people think that he's a top five midfielder in the world. Well, I just think right now he's he's the best midfielder in in, in the world of football, uh, even better than Luke and Modric at this stage of his career. So I think it it all comes down to the fact that you know for some reason people don't consider Casemiro, uh, Modric, and Cross to be as great as as they've been and uh, for 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 so many years as they have been. Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, part of it had to do with the fact that Real Madrid, that same midfield, went through a, quite a funk. If we we can't forget that, like it was basically after Ronaldo left, True. the season after, and really the season after that, um, there was there was a lot of discussion on like maybe we should move on from Casemiro, Cruz, and Modric. Yeah. I, I I was yeah. I was kind of part of it, so I'm not going to. Absolve yeah, myself too. of me the too. blame, yeah. right? So true. Um, but they've had a resurgence, and I. So part of the problem is that English pundits they don't really watch Real Madrid. It, that's just a, right. it's just truth. Um, they're generalists. They don't really watch all Real Madrid games. Some of the stuff you you probably didn't have the same commentator in Spain, but some of the stuff our commentator said on the broadcast on the English broadcast. Something like there was one thing, one like a lot of Casemiro just misinformation. Like just he he literally knew nothing about Casemiro. Everything he said was the opposite of what Casemiro was. Just a, really, a lot of weird comments, and it was clear that these guys just don't watch Real Madrid play. Yeah. Um, I and I and I don't really know exactly what else was said, but I did see a clip of Michael Owen saying that you can overpower the Cruz Motor Casemiro midfield, but with with sheer physicality or strength or something like that. And I'm like, do you Modric at even if Mortar, if you shrunk him down to like two foot five, he would still bully you off the ball. He's so strong yeah. for his frame, and Casemiro is Casemiro. And the other thing is like, like Patrick says, maybe they're past their peak. I would actually argue the only one out of these three past their peak is Mortar. I think Cruz and Casemiro are actually in their peak right now. Um, right now, yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense that they're, this midfield is still so good theoretically because Cruz and Casemiro are still in their peak, and Mortar, who isn't, is still playing amazing. So. Um, yeah. but I will say, like, if you rewind the conversation to before the game, and part of this is that Thiago didn't start, but if you put like Thiago, Wijnaldum, um, Fabinho, these guys are all great midfielders. So some people who thought that, you know, Liverpool could, I don't know if boss is the right word, but certainly go at least put up a better fight than they did. It wouldn't have been surprising to me. Um, and I think your point about why isn't this as, lauded as Busquets, Xavi, and Yes. Well, part of it is just the the P- PR. It's great marketing from Barca. It's, oh, yeah. It's, oh, you know, yeah. this was a, the golden generation. We played incredible football, short passes, tiki-taka, like all that stuff. It's It just plays into the marketing, and, and they were great. Yeah. They argue, arguably are the greatest midfield trio of all time together. So it's not not that, that that's wrong, but I think Casemiro, Kroos, and Modric didn't have that same agenda being pushed behind them. So I think part of that reason is it's just different. It's you know they were very successful in their own way, um, and it's just a different kind of it's a different kind of success, I guess. And and again, I don't think Kroos gets the praise he deserves. No, no, on on international media, I think he's he's considered a great midfielder. But not uh, not in the same category as Modric, for example. And I think those are those belong in the same conversation. I mean, I think Cross deserves to be considered a, a, at least as great as Modric uh, has been. Not even now. I'm not saying about as, as, as at least as good Modric is right now. I'm saying that from his own career and, and, and overall, I think Cross deserves to be in the same conversation. Obviously, Cross uh, didn't, you know, was did receive more help from from Germany and route to the to the Euro and and the World Cup while Modric pretty much single-handedly led Croatia to a World Cup final and that pretty much won him the the Ballon d'Or well deserved I mean obviously kudos and well deserved and, and a very happy Real Madrid fan 
to see a, a, a great midfielder like Modric winning the Ballon d'Or, but I think Cross deserves to be in the same category, in the same conversation, and I think he's criminally underrated. There was a, there was a tweet from an English blogger that went viral. I don't know if you saw it, but I thought that no. if you would have seen it, you would have you would have some you would have done something like to yourself <laughs> what in, did he say? in shock what did he and say? horror. So he tweeted it in March, and uh, he said people still think there's going to be a day. I, Jose retweeted. That's why. That's how I saw it. People All still right. think there's going to be a day where some regista comes to the Premier League and owns it. I'm telling you now, Cruz would be a traffic cone in the middle of a roundabout. You simply don't get time on the ball to set up a three-minute comp of you dictating oh play God. like you do versus Osasuna. And oh uh, of God. course, like after the Liverpool masterclass, that tweet just went viral of people just destroying him. Oh I think, God. anyway, from what I saw. I don't know. Yeah, no comment. No comment. <laughs> I, and that speaks volumes about the fact that I I, I just truly believe that Cross is underrated just because of his lack of, you know, physical attributes in the sense like, you know, Modric is obviously uh, not very tall, but he's a very physical player. And obviously the, the Premier League pundits saw him do great things for Tottenham for many years. But I think that people just don't pay attention to Cross just because of his style of play and... and um, while I do think that uh, definitely Real Madrid's own tactical system definitely benefit uh, his own uh, his own style of play, I think that he's definitely a world class midfielder, and he he would be a world class midfielder no matter where you put him. 